Uh, my name is Nancy McComb. I'm one of the librarians here in Chelmsford. Uh, so tonight we welcome back Kate Donovan of Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens. Kate helps clients grow food through lectures, garden planning, soil testing, tilling, and building raised beds. She's the founder of a 69,000 member Facebook gardening group called Vegetable Fruit, Herbs, and Flower Gardening. Kate maintains eight extra long raised beds, uh, considers her home her horticultural laboratory, and tries new varieties and techniques every year. At Blackstone Valley Veggie Gardens, their mission is to inspire others to grow their own fresh produce. They deliver residential and community-based training, consulting, and assistance in vegetable gardening. They are dedicated to the belief that most people should have the knowledge and opportunity to grow their own wholesome fruits and vegetables. Tonight, she will talk to us about attracting native pollinators. Pollinators are the lifeblood of good food production. We will explore ways to attract bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and other beneficials to your garden. All right, so please send any questions you have for Kate to the Q&A module or the chat and they will be answered after the program. This meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted and shared with all who register tomorrow. So thank you so much for joining us and welcome Kate. Thank you very much, Nancy. Okay, so this one, you know, I do a lot of presentations, sometimes several in a week. Um, and this is one of my favorites, you know, I. There's a lot of many, many different uh, types of gardening. And, you know, I basically I am a sustainability food type of gardener and an organic one at that. I am a 15 year cancer survivor. And one of the things that I thought made a lot of sense is to give up a lot of those chemicals that plague us in the grocery store. So, um, and, and, you know, as Nancy said, one of the best ways to have a healthy ecosystem and a healthy backyard is to um, is is to invite the pollinators in. So, this this presentation is about befriending the native pollinators in our area, the bees, the butterflies, and the hummingbirds. Before I begin, let me just tell you there are a lot of other insects that that pollinate. House flies pollinate, um, moths pollinate, and uh, there's all kinds of insects out there that 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 pollinate. But bees alone account for uh, seventy percent of all the uh, all the pollination. So, okay, there we go. So, before we go, just to let you know that um, this is not a bee. These are the buggers that uh, chase you around uh, around your backyard when you happen to put your foot in the wrong place or put your arm in the wrong place uh, when you disturb them. These are yellow jackets and sometimes mistakenly called uh, bees, meat bees. They're actually similar in size, um, but they're actually wasps. They have a yellow jacket and that's why they call them yellow jackets. And they actually have, um, they're the only insect that has yellow legs. So that's the way you'll be able to tell. Now, uh, a lot of times, if you leave a yellow jacket uh, nest undisturbed, they won't just come out of nowhere and, and sting you. However, uh, a, a yellow jacket nest can kill you. You know, there can be 1500 soldiers and they're just ready to pounce. Typically they live, the big ones, the big nests live in the ground as do the vast majority of the native bees uh, as you'll see in the presentation. Um, they, they, don't, uh, they don't pollinate well because they're not fuzzy. They don't eat, they don't go for the pollen, but they do like sweet and they will climb into one of your peaches and when you go to pull the peach off the tree, you know, they'll still sting you then. Just a little story about pollinators. Um, I remember I had I, one year I was growing my, uh, a lot of my root veggies in, uh, in false bottom containers, self-watering containers, they call it. They actually had false bottoms that you fill up with water. Well, I had one that I, I was going to fill up. The, the crops weren't growing very well in it. So anyway, I put my trowel in there to find out what was going on. And there was a, uh, a yellow jacket nest growing in that false bottom. 
and they came out and, and swarmed me. I had to spray them with the hose to, to get them off. They, you know, there were just a few of them. And from then on, uh, you know, when I went out to do my gardening work, I would just work around that planter and I had no issues with them. If you don't attack them, you know, they don't, they don't bother you. So, but in any case, if you do have an issue with yellow jackets coming out of the ground or out of your shed and they, and it's pervasive and you spray the, you know, the raid or what have you to try to deter them and they keep coming out, you may have to call an exterminator. If you do mistakenly encounter a big, huge nest, uh, you can go into anaphylactic shock, you know, being stung all over and it can actually kill you or your children or your dog because the silly dogs are, are too, you know, they're, they're sometimes too dumb to just mind their own business. You know, I have two of them, so I can say that. And I'm an animal lover. So um, just to let you know, this is, um, I went out to dinner uh, one time, uh, this is a couple of years ago, kind of old video with my son. And this is just a little, um, uh, a little uh, uh, garden. Most, most of these are perennials, not all natives in, in South Bellingham. And, you know, just being next to it, this was probably around this time of year. That's salvia in the mint family. You see black-eyed Susans. There is some uh, hydrangeas in that patch. But this restaurant had a nice little garden uh, in there. And there were literally, literally hundreds and hundreds of bumblebees. That's basically what I see around my yard for the most part until this year are the, the humble bumbles. And, you know, I try to tell my, my granddaughter, she's five, I tell her, don't be afraid of the fuzzy ones. You know, when you see them, when you see them on, you know, on a flower or, uh, you know, on, on your plants, uh, leave, leave, just leave, or on your veggie plants, just leave them be, uh, pardon the pun. And, you know, they, they, they don't be afraid of them. They won't, they won't hurt you. And, and they certainly won't. I was very, very close. This video was taken with my phone. As you can see, they're swarming everywhere. That's not really unusual. So, oops, next page. Okay, so these are some of the crops. Um, you know, some, some crops, uh, we rely on the, the fruit of the crops. And I'm talking about our, our fruit trees, for example, our tomatoes, for example. And especially crops in our, what they call the cucurbit family, the melon, the squash, and uh, melon, melon, squash, and cucumber. The cucurbit family has a male flower and it has a female flower. They can be on the same plant, you know, but you have to get the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. Sometimes the wind just doesn't take it there. You know, so, you know, we want to grow a lot of food. Sometimes we grow our gardens really thick and, the, and other, other branches get in the way and, and uh, you know, you don't get that wind. So uh, with, especially within the, uh, you know, fruiting and within that cucurbit family, you certainly uh, can benefit from, from the pollinators. So we need them for our apples, uh, peaches, plums, cherries, melons, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, cranberries, onions, beans, sunflower, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli. Now the, these, the sunflower and the, uh, excuse me, cauliflower, uh, cabbage and broccoli, they're, the reason why you need them is because they actually have a, a, a they come to seed within their second year. But if you let them grow, you do need them. Brussels sprouts, uh, beetroot, and uh, pumpkin. So we definitely need the, and if, you know, I, I tell people we had an issue. Um, I also um, got a lot of garden projects going on from, I'd say, 10 months out of the year. This is a very busy time. I, I manage a, a community garden where all the food goes to the food pantry and also uh, a garden club. 
I'm the president of our garden club. But we had an issue. Uh, we had we had tomatoes growing and peppers growing really well. Those are uh, night uh, nightshade crops. But our squash and our uh, cucumbers weren't growing that well. So I know they needed pollinators, but what can you do? I mean, it's kind of late. We did have some flowers there, but we didn't have enough. So what we ended up doing is we ended up hand pollinating, meaning we took off one of those male flowers and smushed it up inside the female flower early in the morning when the flowers are open in order to pollinate it. And that was fine for a few, right? I mean, it's not gonna kill us to do it a few times, but can you imagine commercial, commercial gardens or this big, these big farms out West manually pollinating, you know, all, all the, the food, it just, it just wouldn't work. So anyway, we're blessed here in, in, this, in Southern New England because we have 370 different varieties of bees here native bees, believe it or not. Um, most of them live in the ground and most of them are solitary. Some don't even have stingers at all. So um, and they, they live in the ground. They, they don't, you know, they don't live in trees. You know, when you see those, when you see one of those paper, uh, you know, those paper nests, with all the little um, octagon shapes, it's made out. Of, that's a wasp's nest. It's not a. Uh, it's not not for your bees. Anyway, so the ground nesters in solitary bees. Uh, one of the varieties is a adrenidae, and those are your mining bees and your mi minor bees. What do they eat? They eat in a vast majority of these flowers uh, that I'm gonna tell you to grow are native uh, to the area, native to North America. So they eat butterfly weed, not to be confused with the butterfly bush, that's not native. And I'm hearing that's not really good for the ecosystem. So a butterfly weed, milkweed, we'll go over milkweed when we talk about the, the monarchs. Nipplewort, Eastern purple coneflower, um, Coneflower is otherwise known as echinacea, comes in purples and whites. It's a very pretty flower. Smooth oxeye, common bird foot, trefoil, Canadian goldenrod, Italian clover, white clover, dandelion, other clovers and vetch. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the clovers and the dandelion. First of all, they grow low to the ground and they come up fairly early. I think there's a reason for that, a, a, a reason, uh, you know, something that mother nature does because when the bees first come out of the ground, uh, they need something to eat. And so these, are, these crops are, are low to the ground. So this is why people nowadays try to wait till actually well into May or pretty much till May is over to mow their lawn because there's a lot of bees and a lot of pollinators that are living off their clovers and their dandelions. Uh, so, you know, try to try to be kind. If you're going crazy and you, you, know, you want a nice manicured lawn, at least leave them a little patch where they can have their clover and their dandelion. And when I talk about dandelion, I have to, the dandelion is, has been, <laughs> has been the bane of my existence for a very long time, meaning that I consider it a weed and I've always my whole life sprayed it, yanked it, dug it, um, you know, and had a, had a lot of uh, uh, fun trying to get rid of it. Now I realize that dandelion uh, is, uh, is, like I say, it's very beneficial to the bees, but not only that, it's a superfood. You can eat the flower. You can eat the stem, you can eat the root, has a lot of health, health benefits to it. Actually, it was brought over uh, by, the, by the pilgrims or some, one of the early, early settlers to use as medicinal, uh, to have medicinal value, which is interesting uh, 
because of course years ago uh, all the plants were uh, you know that was the way that 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 was the pharmacy was with the plants and the herbs. So dandelion is not a uh, a native plant, unlike these others. It's not a native plant. However, uh, it's been here a long time and it ain't going anywhere. So if you have it, um, you know, just leave, try to leave it for the for the bees. Uh, some, you know, so I so anyway, I'm, I'm a little bit more tolerant to it nowadays. So let's talk about the uh, apidae bees, okay? Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk about, and I'll take these these uh, each one one at a time. The honey bee. Let me tell you about a honey bee. It is not native. It cannot exist in Massachusetts on its own because it comes from Europe, and it's it's it does not get used to these cold temperatures. It needs to be in, uh, you know, boxed up, and it, you know, and it needs beekeepers to take care of them over the cold season. Um, however, bumble bumblebees are incredible. They can actually fly five miles from the hive, do pollinating, and they'll find their way back to their beloved queen. They're unbelievable. Um, I have had my yard. And I know Nancy read about Nancy read about my uh, you know having I think it was seven or eight beds. I have ten now, and every year that I've been growing food, the main uh, pollinating source was the, was the humble bumble, the big fat bumblebee. Uh, but this year I've seen a lot of honeybees, and you know knowing what I know, I figured one of my neighbors must be a beekeeper. And then I realized that it was the neighbor across the street. So I thanked her very much for keeping those bees. I'm sure she gets the honey out of it and enjoys it, and explaining beekeeping to her children as a, as a wonderful hobby. Um, but I've never had such an awesome garden. The honeybees are extraordinary uh, pollinators. Uh, you know, and they've had their issues, you know, because it, uh, climate change or, or what have you, there's been a lot of colony collapse. And I think they've kind of narrowed it down to, uh, uh, you know, maybe, you know, maybe pesticides or what have you. There's still a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of disagreement on what, what caused the colony collapse, but hopefully they're on the upswing at, at this point. So, so honeybees, um, as I say, they're not, they're not native. And, um, you know, they are wonderful, wonderful pollinators cannot live in the winter without a beekeeper taking care of them. They're like cattle or sheep. They're just not wild animals. They're, they're domesticated here. So the, uh, and they live in hives, obviously they live in, in when, in, in, um, also when they, where they come from in, in England or, you know, France or wherever with a, with their native. Uh, you know, it's probably a, a different story, but, but here uh, they're, they're not, uh, they can't live. So uh, the bumblebees, let's talk about the bumblebees. Bumblebees are those big fat ones that you see all, over everything. They come out in the spring, uh, very, very docile. Uh, however, you know that when a bumblebee stings you, uh, you know, if a honeybee stings you, it's going to lose its, uh, it's going to lose its stinger and it's going to die uh, a honeybee but a bumblebee can sting you many times it doesn't want to and it won't unless it's protecting the queen a bumblebee also has a queen it is a uh, it is a social bee just like the honeybee uh, and they also have big hives underneath the ground you know, I, I've never had an issue with a bumblebee. And those are the ones when they're in the garden working, you don't have any worries about them at all. So, and I can't say that obviously if you're allergic to bees, you know, you may want to keep your distance a little bit, but other than that, they have another uh, uh, cousin in that family and that's the carpenter bee. The carpenter bee can live and bore in wood 
and it's a solitary bee. Uh, the the female can sting, but they're big. That's the only bee that you'll see in our area of New England that's actually bigger than a bumblebee. And it looks like a bumblebee, except the butt is uh, is shiny, black. It's not fuzzy like a bumblebee. So you'll see the difference. You say, wow, that looks like a huge, huge bumblebee. It could very well be a carpenter bee. As long as they are living, you know, if they do live on wood, as long as they're not living in your house, they are good pollinators. And as I say, they're quite docile. The male can't even sting at all. So we'll just leave, again, leave them be. So what do they eat? The social, the uh, apodase, they eat giant blue hyssop, buckwheat, pretty lupine is a pretty plant, grows all the way up in Maine, Nova Scotia, north of here. Wild bergamot, a species in the rose family, Canadian goldenrod, gloxinia, dandelion, and ironweed. You're going to see a few of these um, when we review these bees. Um, you'll see that a lot of a lot of these different types of bees like dandelion, and a lot of them like clover. And there's a few other uh, be, uh, other flowers you'll see repeated. Okay, the colliday. Day, excuse me. These are long words. These are family, these are solitary bees. When a bee is solitary, it means it doesn't, it lives in its little family, but it, me, it means that it doesn't have a strict hierarchy and it doesn't have to protect the queen. So it's not as aggressive. Okay. Um, they're awesome though. They are awesome pollinators. Uh, many species give semi-solid balls to their young. These are the plaster bees and the mask bees. And they go for the Canadian goldenrod and a specific species in, of roses. The helicidae, those are sweat bees. Every now and then you'll be, in the, you'll be in the garden and, oh, on these hot days, I know we've had a whole bunch of them. Nancy was telling me that you've had some really hot, hot weather. We've had some here too. And I'm in New Hampshire on vacation. Um, and every once in a while, you know, you, it feels like it, it's like there are little, little tiny uh, fruit flies or something on you. Those are actually bees. Some of them are quite tiny and they're iridescent, like a green iridescent color. Those are bees. Do they pollinate as well as the big fat uh, bumblebee? No, I don't think so. But they're uh, they're pollinating. They're trying. You know, they're part of our ecosystem. So we'll try to be kind to them, uh, just as just as much. So uh, so these are cuckoo bee, helictus, agapostemon. And what do they like? They like the butterfly weed, black eyed susan. I love black eyed susan and and its cousin, the brown eyed susan. Sunflowers. Cone flowers, another name for echinacea, buttercups, milkweed, clover. Again, that clover, clover comes up. You know, I leave it in my garden. It's actually clover is actually in the um, in the pea family. They have special attributes. They actually leach uh, nitrogen out of the soil, out of the air, and bring it into the soil. It's good for the soil. It's not a nasty, obnoxious weed. So I, I leave that and I leave them actually in my vegetable garden when I when I weed until they get too big. And then you, you, I may have some contention with the roots, but I basically leave them. Um, Canadian golden lilacs and the giant blue high sob. Those are for the sweat bees. Oh, my goodness. Mega chillidae. Uh, these uh, most species carry collective pollen on their abdomen. Uh, these bees are extremely efficient pollinator due, pollinators due to the pollen collection method and the high number of pollen visits. The leaf cutters and the mason bees. And what do they pollinate? They love blueberries, cranberries, and again, that giant blue hyssop, clover, and ironweed. So, megachilidae. All right, so bees. This is uh, this is bee balm. You see the red one. This is what you and I see. 
when we look at bee ball. Over here, this is what the bees see because they see an ultraviolet light. So the pollen lights up like a, like a beacon right here and you can see the pathways. Uh, so this flower or mother nature is, is giving a signal to the bees on where to go to get that pollen. So that's what the bee uh, sees. Incredible, isn't it? Prettier than the old red, the plain old red one that we see. So let's talk about the bees and giving them a drink. Um, bees will work and work. And this is why, you know, like I say, I tell my granddaughter, just, just watch them and see what they're doing because if they weren't there, you wouldn't get all those raspberries you like and you wouldn't get the cucumbers that you that you like. So just, you know, let them do their work, but they get so tired, they can actually die. Uh, they work themselves to death. So you can give them a drink. The whole thing is if you just put out a plate of water, they're so exhausted they can drown. So you have to give them something to stand on. So some people give them, uh, put rocks down and some people put some pretty, pretty marbles down. Uh, you know, whatever's decorative in, in your yard. But uh, it says to pick a dish that's blue, white, or yellow. And that's the, uh, the colors the bees are attracted to. Uh, sprinkle gravel or small pebbles in the bottom of the dish, then fill it with water. And the rocks will, or the, uh, or the pebbles will serve as a landing uh, spot for the bees. And put the bee bath in a nice, quiet part of the yard. Uh, I don't have those because I have two dogs and they're, they're pretty loud, but uh, the quietest part of the yard uh, because they do have good hearing. Okay, so in summary for the bee portion, uh, these, are the, these are some of the perennial uh, wildflowers that you may um, you know, want to grow to attract bees to, to your garden. Lupine, beautiful uh, lupine. It's really easy to grow. Some people grow it from seed. And I say it's very hardy. It grows everywhere. It grows way north of us and south of us. Um, grow it in very in a lot in different colors, and it's quite nice. And then there's that notorious uh, dandelion uh, that you can eat the whole. I mean, af after the the, the pollinators uh, come, you can certainly eat the whole plant. Even at the end of the season, you can dig it up and uh, and eat the roots as well. Uh, but, you know, if you leave it in there, it actually conditions the soil. The roots go down and actually condition the soil. So they are, they, they are very beneficial. And there's the goldenrod. You hear, you know, you going over the different varieties of bees. You keep seeing uh, the goldenrod come up and the ironweed as well. So, okay, I am going to stop sharing this uh, for a moment. And I have to do something here. I got to reshare it. Bear with me here. Yeah. Okay, this one, this one, and this one. Okay. Okay, here is a little video of the butterflies. And, and you can just be aware of the movement of these uh, beautiful, these are monarchs. Hi gang, Alan from Ultra Slow. Butterflies, I just love butterflies. Butterflies help pollinate flowers in the same way the bees do, by going from flower to flower, carrying the pollen, and helping to ensure that we have food. Unfortunately, just like the bees, the butterflies are dying off. So let's try and limit our pesticides, limit the bug sprays, and uh, watch and enjoy how the butterfly goes from flower to flower. You can see their long curved tongue or mouth part that looks like a little semicircle in front of them as they fly off. They extend that down into the flower and you get to see them drink the nectar from, the, from each flower. Hummingbirds do the same thing. It's a long clip of just beautiful images of butterflies. Enjoy.
trying to get the picture, very graceful. And, you know, of course, when you see them in real time, they just, the butterflies just flutter by, as my mom used to say. So it's good to actually see how graceful they are in slow motion. So you're going to see a lot of butterflies uh, in your garden before they actually turn to butterflies. So you'll see the caterpillars and it's good to notice them because each different butterfly has a very distinctive looking uh, caterpillar that goes along with it. And it's, it's good to know them and, and to anticipate what they're gonna look like after their metamorphosis. So here is the black swallowtail. These are all swallowtails. They live on your parsley, your carrot, and your dill, and the, they're all in the same family. And here's a black swallowtail. I see these quite often in, uh, in my garden. And sometimes they don't leave me much parsley, but that's okay. I don't mind sharing it with, with them. Okay, so here is the, and I looked, by the way, I did a whole, whole ton of research on how common uh, these insects were and which ones were most common in our area of uh, Massachusetts. So, uh, there's a Canadian swallowtail. I've seen a few of those as well. White, white butterfly with, with some orange coloring. The Eastern swallowtail, also very common. Look how plain looking the caterpillar is compared with the black swallowtail. And then there's the spice, spice bush swallowtail. Looks kind of spooky, but look how beautiful the, uh, the uh, butterfly is. And here's some other ones that are common, uh, very common. The white sulfur, the, the orange sulfur, they almost look like moths. Uh, and then the American copper, I've had quite a few. I haven't seen them a couple of years, but I've had quite a few of them in the garden. And then the brown elfin, I've seen some of those. Some of them don't look pretty, look quite as spectacular as the big flashy ones, but they, they pollinate nonetheless, so. So let's talk about the monarchs, okay? And if you've watched the news within the last, I guess maybe even the last week or the last couple of weeks, um, you'll, you'll see that our monarch butterflies have actually uh, made it to the endangered species list. And uh, I'm saddened by that, but I'm not surprised. So, you know, the, the monarchs are kind of a litmus test on how well we're doing as, as stewards of the, of the earth, uh, as custodians to this wonderful planet. So let me just tell you a little bit about these monarchs. Uh, they migrate over 3000 miles from Mexico to Canada. Obviously they're Mexico in the summer, Canada in the winter and all the way back 3000 miles hundreds of millions of them on the same track and they reproduce on the way, okay? They only can reproduce on, they only lay their eggs on milkweed. This is why she was telling me that she grows milkweed as I do as well, common milkweed. There are four or five varieties of milkweed that the monarchs will lay their eggs on. Uh, and they do that on purpose. Milkweed is typically poison to a lot of critters, and but not the milkweed. I mean, excuse me, not the monarch. So it doesn't want you know anything to encroach on uh, on the young, obviously. So it not only does it lay its eggs there, but the uh, the monarch is the only plant that the young, once they hatch, can actually eat. The uh, the I'm, I'm sorry before the 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 uh, sorry uh, the the, uh, the monarch only lays its eggs on, uh, on the milkweed and the milkweed is the only thing that the uh, caterpillar actually eats. Um, you'll see the mature monarch butterflies will, will, will eat the, the nectar of other flowers, but uh, it has, needs that milkweed in order to survive. Um, so what used to happen is, um, in, in the United States, you know, if you've ever been out West, you see the Midwest is nothing but corn, not all edible corn, corn for cattle, 
going to make ethanol, you know, out of, uh, but there's a whole lot of corn out there. And what, and the milkweed loves to grow between those rows of corn because of course the corn is fertilized by the farmers. So the farmers don't like that. They don't like picking, picking weeds out of their corn bed. So what they've done is they've created GMO corn that's resistant to pesticide, excuse me, herbicide. And they fly over the, uh, the corn crops and they spray them with herbicide. But this new GMO corn doesn't bother them in the least bit. They stay fat and happy, but it kills all the, uh, all the milkweed. And what happens to that GMO corn? It actually sucks up all the uh, all that herbicide into it, and you know there you can read a lot of things about the dangers of glyphosate and Roundup, whatever you want to call it. But they say it's really not that healthy for us. So uh, so that's why the reason is that it's being that the uh, the milkweed is being. killed off, uh, but they can do that now because the uh, 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 herbicide uh, resistant GMO crops don't mind in the least bit. Uh, so uh, last year, the number of monarchs that migrated to Mexico was the lowest ever recorded, a mere 0.67 hectares of forest down from 21 hectares in the 1996 to 1997 season. They were doing well. I heard last year they were doing well in California, but as I say, they just got put on the endangered species list. The amazing thing about the monarchs is that every year they make that 3000 mile trek, but the same monarch that starts out from Canada doesn't make it back to Canada. It dies. And for some miraculous uh, 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 reason, the the you know the offspring know how to pick up and take that trek and continue on where the parent left off. So it's an amazing uh, uh, story. This is an amazing story. Now, uh, and you know there are here are the wildflowers to grow to attract butterflies. Milkweed, as I say, for the monarchs, specifically milkweed. Um, milkweed, if you do want to grow it, be aware that you have to, and you open up, you know, if you crack open this big pod, there's a ton of seeds in there. You have to plant them in the fall. If you plant them in the spring, you better make sure, if you, if you harvest them when the, when the pods are ready to pop, uh, and you want to plant them in the spring, you have to make sure you have them in the refrigerator for two to three months. Some plants are like that. The seeds need to cold stratify. If not, you'll have a very spotty, very poor germination rate on your milkweed. And the, the actual plants, uh, if you want, because they pop up, you know, if they're growing, they pop up in, all over the place. However, when you go to transplant them, they a lot of times they die. You really got to get dig in and get a deep, really decent piece of root. And even then, you may not be able to do it. But but give it a try. Queen Anne's lace, uh, Queen Anne's lace. Uh, it's a you know it's a native plant. It's actually uh, a, 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 a primitive carrot is what it is. It's a biennial. It gives you that pretty white flower. Uh, and some butterflies like that, that goldenrod that, you know, that the bees like, the butterflies like it as well. And then there's a butterfly weed, as you'll see on the bottom, quite pretty. So those are the wildflowers to grow to attract butterflies. So here is, let me show you this uh, video clip. This is the ruby-throated hummingbird. There are many hummingbirds that have brilliant colors, but the ruby throated is the only one that makes it up this far north. I've seen a ton of them since I've been here in New Hampshire. And uh, they're very curious, little tiny.
critters that uh, love to come in and say hello. They go come right next to your face and uh, we enjoy them. notice about this little guy first of all it is a little guy a guy male because you see his he's very iridescent and that ruby red is is you know throat is uh you know it shimmers so you know it's a male also you notice he hops around a little but you won't see them walking along the ground like a um you know like a robin hopping around they're 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 legs are very spindly and weak so they spend most of their time flying around and they sound like little little helicopters so let me let's watch a couple more seconds of this i could watch them all day um However, you know, they just come and go, buzz, 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 like almost like a, like a bee, uh, they, they go so fast. So the ruby-throated hummingbird, I don't want to pronounce that Latin name. Oh, maybe I will. Archilichus colubrid is a species of a hummingbird that generally spends the winters in South America, Central America, Mexico, and Florida, and it migrates to the Eastern North America for the summers to breed. It is far the most common hummingbird east of the Mississippi River in North America. So it's basically the one that we see. And you may say that you've seen another one that doesn't have a ruby throated, but it's just the misses. And as you know, for a lot of birds, the female is not quite as brightly colored uh, because she has to tend to the nest and kind of blend in. So uh, they are 2.8 to 3.5 inches tall. Uh, they, the wingspan is about three and a half inches and they only weigh four grams. So they're very, birds are lightweight anyway. You know, they have to fly, so they're very lightweight. The adult males um, are metallic green above and grayish white below with near black wings and they flap those wings 70 times per second. So as I say, that's why it sounds like an, an egg beater. A uh, lot of flapping going on. The legs are so weak that they rarely rest on them. Uh, so when you see one that's not flying, he's in trouble. And they actually have a lifespan of about seven years. So while the, the uh, migratory Butterflies don't make it all the way through that trek from Canada to Mexico uh, to from Canada to Mexico. The hummingbirds certainly do make that whole journey. So the hummingbirds that you see in your backyard may indeed be the same family uh, that comes back from year to year. So they're a lot of fun. Okay, so just to tell you a little bit about it, you know, in that in that clip you saw in the background that there's a hummingbird feeder. Um, the, the hummingbirds come in fairly early in the season. And when you're a, a garden nut and a plant nut and the nature nut like I am, and you have a lot of, a lot of Facebook friends, there's a lot of, oh, I saw my first hummingbird, I'm so excited. So they, they uh, come in with a big parade, uh, you know, because people love to see them. So at the time they come in, there isn't that much out there for them to eat. So this is why some people feed them sugar water. There's a recipe for it. You have to look it up. It's water and, um, and 
plain or I, I would use a good, you know, bottled water, filtered water and cane sugar. You know, you would think that you would may want to feed them something more exotic like honey or brown sugar, or something nutritious or what have you. But don't because they, their bodies won't know how to uh, handle it. They're used to drinking the, the pollen. I mean, the uh, the nectar from the plants. So what they need is a real simple sugar. So there are recipes out there. I hear in order to dissolve the sugar properly, you boil it first and then you can put it in the uh, uh, in the bird feeder. And the, and the bird feeders can be red because I guess they're attracted to that color. If you feed them, I don't feed them. I don't really want any uh, animal in the wild being dependent upon me for anything like that. Um, I may feed, I may give the bees a drink, uh, but basically the way I feed them is, um, is just through growing, growing plants. That's, that's just me. If you want to set up a hummingbird feeder, uh, the whole thing is you, you do see hummingbird uh, food out there, you know, that is artificially red. You don't really need that. I don't know why anybody would feed a beautiful wild bird, uh, you know, some kind of fake artificial food coloring, um, but you, you just need a, a, a bird feeder, you know, one of the uh, hummingbird feeders and, and water and uh, sugar. So regular cane sugar. So wildflowers to grow to attack, attack, attract hummingbirds. A lot of these, uh, you know, have uh, flowers where they can actually stick their, uh, you know, their beak into and get some nectar. Salvia, columbine, bee balm, uh, honeysuckle, and pink turtle head. Okay, in summary, in order to entice native pollinators, grow organic wildflowers. Okay, also, since many bees live in the ground, don't forget the low flower, the, the flowering low plants like simple dandelion and clover. They will probably come to see you anyway. So just leave them be and, uh, you know, don't mow your lawn too early in the season. And if you do have to mow it, if you have one of those neighborhoods where someone's going to complain, leave a little, not a bad idea to leave a little patch for them in case they are hungry especially the bees when they come out of, uh, come out of the ground. Uh, butterflies and hummingbirds enjoy flowers they can stick their long snouts into. Picture long, thin flowers like tiger lilies. Hummingbirds see an ultraviolet light, near ultraviolet light, which is why they like the reds, pinks, and the orange. Many fruits and vegetable flowers are also brightly colored. They stand out to animals uh, such as the hummingbirds and insects more so than humans. Also, if you're intending to grow wildflowers from seed to share, harvest your own seed. As I say, you see those big fat pods that are produced by the, uh, by the milkweed. Uh, your uh, black-eyed Susan certainly, you know, produce seed as well. Even some of your annuals that, that you know, that don't uh, come back from the root will actually self self seed like your zinnias, et cetera. So, um, so save your own seeds, keep them airtight in a nice cool and dry place and share them with your friends. They'll love them. Also, when you choose the flowers and plants for your garden, make sure that they're either perennials, meaning they come back year after year by themselves from the root or self-seeding annuals, meaning they have a one-year life cycle, uh, but they, they, they propagate uh, seeds from seed. So the seed falls and it grows back. In summary, stay away from any kind of weed killer. Do not use chemical pesticides. Uh, you know, a lot of people I know really protect their food products. They feed those, you know, their food crops, they feed those food, that food to their, to their children and, you know, their parents and their spouses. And, 
they don't use it. So don't use it on your ornamentals either, because you know there are uh, you could be damaging the, the the pollinators. Don't use a so weed killers. That's an herbicide, and don't use pesticide. Uh, beware the chemicals that in in any chemical that will kill a pest. You know you have an infestation of something. Anything that will kill a pest will also kill a pollinator. So if you do even use a uh, an organic uh, pesticide for Japanese beetles say, do not spray them uh, when the flowers are open. You know, spray them maybe at night if the flowers are closed up. Um, or you, you can use other methods as well. Uh, growing, growing perennials is a great way, but you know, people think growing perennial flowers, you know, to attract pollinators is easy, but it isn't because they spread and they have to be pruned and cut back, et cetera, and they have to be replenished. So replenish them with nutrients. And the best way to do that is by continuing to add humus or your own compost. If you make your own compost, that's a wonderful food um, for, your, for your plants. And you'll have to use very little, if any, fertilizer. So the weeds love organic gardens as much as your flowers do. You know, they'll, they'll, those weeds, they'll blow in, they'll stay there and, and they'll, uh, you know, they probably won't do any harm, but they don't look nice. So people want to get rid of them. So the good, best way to get rid of them is to have them not go there in, in the first place, prevent them. And you can do that by using, using a good helping of mulch. You can use a pine mulch, a straw mulch, or you can use chopped up fall leaves. Each of those will turn to compost over time. I am not a big one for the black mulch or the colored bright red orangey mulch that you buy in the, in the, in the store, you know, for $4.97 for the two cubic feet, because I don't know what it's made from. I don't know, you know, it's got some coloring in it. And I, I just don't know how uh, beneficial that is to the pollinators. So, it, and, and better yet, if you have a friend or if you ever have trees taken down, what those, uh, you know, the, the trees, uh, pe people that take the trees down, what they do is they have them chopped up and, and then, you know, they, they end up disposing of it and they have to pay to dispose of it. Have them leave you some, you know, at uh, one time I had some trees removed. I, I kept a whole big, huge pile of it. My neighbors loved me and I got rid of it within a season. And, you know, it helped me use that as a mulch uh, on my plants for years. So, so, all right. So resources. Uh, okay. So if you want to get the organic soil, you know, the, like I say, the best way to do it and to grow your flowers is to grow your own compost. But Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, all those places have organic garden soil in the bag, in the gardening tools that you need for planting. Of course, if you want to, if you're growing huge, huge gardens, you may want to get some garden soil, uh, you know, from, uh, from one of those places that sells it in bulk. Uh, but you can get the bag stuff. They do have the organic stuff. And I use organic stuff in my, you know, for my wildflowers as well. The New England Wildflower Society is a great resource for buying native plants, programs, and resources. And you can uh, check them out online. The Vermont Wildflower Farm provides seeds that you can order online. Uh, you know, these are New England uh, places and the vast majority of the uh, seeds that can be grown right here as well in Massachusetts. And this is my website and I can answer any questions you have and provide services that can help you grow your, grow your garden or maintain your garden. Okay, let me see if there's any, and this is my email. If you'd like a copy of this presentation to share with your friends, I know it's kind of pretty um, and it's got some decent information in it please send me, uh, send me an email and I will certainly get back to you uh, with a copy of the presentation, some other links as well. Okay. All right, let's just see. Oh, okay, Janet, okay, okay, so 
Janet asked, will you be emailing a copy of the recorded talk? Yes. Okay, very good. Okay. Any other any other questions, Janet? If you do, you can write it in the chat. Yep. Yep. So hi again. Um, for me, it's not it's not exactly a question, but I'll say I was really um impressed by the number and the variety of bees that you were talking about. It's I've, amazing, isn't it? I've isn't lived in New amazing? England my whole life and uh, hadn't heard of some of those. Um, and, yeah. and I feel like I haven't seen them. I feel like I've only seen the ones I knew about. But I bet now if I if I go outside and look in my garden, I'll probably see a little more variety. Look, and you have to look with the different uh, with the different magnifying glass, you know, I mean, a different yeah. mindset. Okay. Like I say, some of the bees are so tiny. You look real close at them. They shine green. But those are the sweat bees, and you may think they're just a little, little tiny fruit fly or something. But it is fascinating, and you know the whole study of entomology. I'm not an ent entomologist, but the whole study of insects is just is just fascinating. And of course, you know being around, uh, you know being around uh, this environment, uh, you know we haven't been very good custodians of the earth. And species that, uh, you know, are we're, we're losing uh, a lot of our species are becoming extinct. And I think if people really um, listen and understood the value of them, then they would do more to protect them. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, having people be more aware is definitely a, a big a big part of it, you know. And it's and so. it's not hard to do in the sense that growing all these wildflowers, they're very some of them are very beautiful. So. They're pretty um, anyway. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's a great hobby. And you yeah. know, the thing is when you get down there and you get your fingers in the dirt and you're actually growing, I don't know why, but there's a magic to it. And um, it's I don't know if it's a spiritual thing or, or whatever it is, but it actually decreases your blood pressure. It mm -hmm. makes you feel really good. And um, it is good for people, all people. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with, with elderly people with dementia and with autistic kids, you know, that are all, all areas of the spectrum. And just some people just, just love, um, you know, love gardening. So mm -hmm. it's good, all good stuff. So, yep. Yep. all right. Anything, any other questions? Okay. I don't see I'll, anything in the chat. So I'll, I'll send you the presentation as well. And Janet, uh, if you send me your email, I'll send it off to you as well. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Have a good evening. And okay. So thanks again. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and, and end Thank it. You. So there's less for Jet. Uh, just get a clip. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.